Wonderful. Thank you for having me. And um, it's nice uh, uh, to take advantage of, of this uh, privileged technology to be able to do this uh, during such difficult pandemic uh, crisis. So uh, I'm glad to be a part of it. Definitely. And it, we're actually seeing inside to a part of your office at the moment. Um, this is like a yeah. space that you've set up. Yeah, we have an open studio, actually, so it's rare that you have a room like this. If you visited any of our studios around the world, you'll see that they're quite open platforms. Um, but occasionally we set aside a space like this for um, uh, acoustic purposes if people are having um, some video conferences, um, which in the past that was not as common, but in recent times with the pandemic, uh, they become very useful. and. I decided to set this up just as an easy way for me to talk without a mask. Mm -hmm. um, but my open studio is just just behind uh, there. Actually, interestingly, I have this wonderful technology. Let me see if I can get it. <laughs> <laughs> you see all that back there? Yeah. So there's, a, oh, cool. there's our studio back there. And uh, I'm in this kind of little space. <laughs> That's really cool. How long have you guys been in this particular uh, office? Um, we've been in New York City a little over 15 years, and we moved into this studio space about five five years ago, I would say, roughly. It was very funny. Um, we had a beautiful studio on Broadway, which was an old 19, late 1920s structure, a very well-known building, which we occupied a kind of bird's nest inside of this fantastic domed room that was built for the Cunard line. Hmm. We loved it, but our, our landlord was very New York style and was constantly giving us trouble and not turning the heat or the air conditioning on when we when we needed it. And so uh, it became so intolerable for the staff that it, as beautiful as the space was, we had to find a, a new space. And this uh, building was owned by uh, someone who was a part of a client group that we were involved with before, mm. and they offered us the space and they were very friendly, but they couldn't get us in this room right away. So we had to, um, they were nice enough to give us an entire floor of the building. This is a, I don't know, 40 story building. And one of the floors, which was about 25,000 square feet, someone had just moved out. It was during the last um, kind of financial turmoil that we had. And mm -hmm. a lot of the financial teams down here in lower Manhattan were moving out of the city after September 11th. So the entire floor was empty. And they said, you can have it temporary, just uh, how long do you, you know, for nine months or something until we get your space ready. And so we moved in and it was very bizarre. They left all the furniture, which was a financial management company. So you can imagine it was a really weird, like old, old time furniture with uh, old time desks. And they moved out so quickly. They left all their Rolodexes and everything. Wow. So all the phone numbers and calendars were on the wall wow. uh, with all their dates marked on them. And even coats were hanging on coats coat racks and of course there were a million um, fake plants everywhere so they had <laughs> plastic plants everywhere and this awful kind of art that you get in a in a you know in sort of bad office art mm -hmm. you know um, <laughs> fake mountainy scenes and whatever so because the space was so big 25,000 square feet we only needed about eight we created several museums on the floor. So we made a museum of bad office art where we collected it all from all over the floor and made this crazy museum. And then we built a botanical garden out of the plastic plants <laughs> that you could go to. And then um, the other fun thing was that they all had these cubicles that are sort of just high enough that you can't see over them and see who's sitting there. But you, if you stood up, you could see across the cubicles. Yeah. And we we're so used to sitting in an open collaborative space, we just couldn't talk tolerate it. Yeah. So we couldn't tear down the cubicles because it was too much effort. So we created little pictures of ourselves that we hung from the ceiling over our desk. So <laughs> you could see everybody's head floating all over the room. So it was very surreal. <laughs> so you guys actually attempted to uh, sort of assimilate or experience what it would be like to work in a cubicle setting. Yes. And, you know, it's interesting because we've been talking about that for many years. Um, and one of the themes that's interesting to me is, uh, you know, the notion of how you build social s sustainability. And that's a, a true at multiple scales. And one of them is at the, obviously the level of an office space. And uh, we've done a, a quite a bit of observation and found that generally speaking in a corporate office space, if it's of a certain variety, you'll have, the, say, the president of that group on one end of the corridor and mm -hmm. at the other end, the vice president. 
uh, in between is the elevator lobby. And if you step off the elevator, you're greeted usually by a secretary. And if you're there to see the president's team or the vice president's team, you turn either left or right. And so there builds up an army of people who support each person. So you have the army that support the president, the army that support the vice president. They usually don't agree. And the secretary that sits in the middle has to take all the hell from both sides. Right. You know, they're the sort of middle ground. And um, and so uh, that built up an understanding of, of what it means to position people, master planning space for people to either coexist or fight against each other. Mm -hmm. And intriguingly, I... Uh, I've been talking a lot about, of course, the Capitol in Washington, D.C. and the government complex th these days in that world. Um, most people um, don't really understand how the offices or the the character of work life in the Capitol uh, exists. Uh, we just see a Capitol building and there's, you know, a Senate office building over there and the White House over there and the Supreme Court over there. But most people don't understand actually how they're laid out, but I've spent time looking at it. And over the years, over the past 10 to 15 years, they have actually altered or changed the office layout of the Congress. Uh, it used to be very mixed. And although the Capitol is clearly suggestive of two separated groups, the Senate and the House, which makes sense. But all the people that work in those groups were not segregated before. They, the House mixed Republican, Democrat. They had shared office spaces. The Speaker of the House sat in the middle uh, and, and, and was able to collect all the groups. Hmm. The senators sat relatively mixed. In the Senate office building, they were not arranged by floor. But over time, as we've begun to kind of build up a polarization, everybody's been split. So Republicans sit in one area, Democrats often sit in another area. The Speaker of the House no longer sits in the middle. And even the rotunda itself is marcated, uh, demar uh, demarcated so that you can't really freely mix if you work there. Wow. Um, there are these ropes that are built up. And the more that we do that, uh, the more polarized we get from a work ethic. And um, I'm right now thinking about a way to try and get um, – Congress and, and, and the political capital of our society to function more like an innovative space, like you might find at Airbnb or Microsoft or Ford or any of these companies where they're building up, like our office, ways to interact, sharing meeting rooms. So you're forced to have to deal with sharing a meeting room with someone you don't necessarily agree with. We need to get that back into politics. Architecture plays a role in politics and in essentially in our social uh, life and the society we build, but we've kind of pushed it off because we think, well, that's politics. No, it's architecture. Oh my goodness! What a way to start this. I, I love. Know. It. I, I love. <laughs> I love that you uh, that the, that you think of uh, the going all the way back to the office discussion in terms of like master planning an office, which is typically a word you think of uh, as related to much larger scale urban things. And I also think this tie to kind of analyzing how. Um, the capital works. Is is this a a project that like an official project you're sort of undertaking? It's going to be published in some way, or or. Well, I hope so. We're working on it, and I'm working on it, and little bits and pieces in between all the other things that we have w that we're working on, which unfortunately is starting to pile up. I think, like many people in the world today, during the pandemic crisis, during the the challenges of the uprising and social justice issues, the number of things that we're yeah. having to um, consider is is serious more so. Than than ever before, climate change and so on. Uh, each of these tasks has an extreme level of importance and trying to find the time to balance that and build a functioning financially stable studio that keeps people employed uh, in a time where we're not even able to sit in the same room easily together uh, is quite quite difficult. But it is a task that, that um, I'm sort of working on slowly. Uh, it, it, um, it's something I've been thinking about for a while myself um, just hmm. as an aside, I can tell you how it all began. Um, when I was very young, I went to the Capitol building like many school children do. I think I was about 10 years old. I happened to live in Washington, D.C. at the time. My father worked at Walter Reed. And um, we went there, and of course, it was a magical experience, this beautiful building. And I mean, again, it's the architecture. It just draws you to its kind of magnificence in many ways. And when you walk into the rotunda, and you stand there and there's this beautiful space, vertical space that is really 
powerful and, and, and inspiring. And over the top of the dome is this beautiful painting with an opening in the sky with, between the clouds. And you look through those clouds up to the, to the, to the heavens, really. Um, and if you stood in the center of the, of the rotunda, which was allowed at that time, you could stand directly under that opening in the clouds. And for that moment, as a 10-year-old, and I stood there, I realized I am the only person standing directly in the middle of the Senate, the Congress, uh, the House, and the Supreme Court with the mall stretching off in front of me in the other direction. It was me, mm -hmm. just me. And the next time when I stood off, somebody else would stand there and they would have that feeling. And that's the essence of democracy. I went back uh, many years later, about 15 years ago, and they had roped off the whole rotunda and you're not allowed to stand in the center anymore um, for various reasons. And they make uh, senators walk on different sides of ropes and pass around in ways that they don't have to actually physically interact with one another as you cross through the only place that's meant to join us together. And that hit me as incredibly powerful. And of course, I began studying architecture some 15, 20 years before that. So suddenly I looked at it with new eyes and that's what empowered me to think about these issues. And I hope uh, after the last four years that we've been through and the challenging next four years we're gonna go through uh, that I can get some of these, we can get some of this information out and show some of the studies that we've, we've, we've taken on. That's incredible. Uh, what reasons did they have for uh, marking off uh, portions of that so you couldn't walk through? Well, you Is can't. It? I can't answer for them. Okay. But I would guess um, there are a number of reasons. Over the years, um, maybe they felt there was a security issue. <clears throat> I'm sure security is always used as a yeah. as a flag for some other thing that you're trying to deal with. Um, I would say they wanted um, right of way, mm. right of way through the rotunda, so they didn't have to interact with other people. Mm -hmm. which is partly security and partly some kind of version of we've got, you know, too much to do. I can't interact with people. But uh, whatever reason it is, it has done two things. It has segregated the people that work there from the people that visit the Capitol that are the people they represent. And it has segregated uh, Senate and the House, and it's segregated those people that are of different parties. So the more walls we build, whether they're invisible or visible, uh, the more polarized we become as a society. And that works even in an office, like a studio. And, uh, you know, I mean, I sit in that room normally when we're filled in a desk, just like everyone else out in the middle. There's private spaces like this that you always need privacy. But uh, creating a connection between uh, the layers of, that are necessary, the hierarchy, helps connect people so that we can work together closer as a society. And most architecture offices, here's a, a kind of a joke I, I, I sometimes say, but I'm slightly serious. Um, many architects are left-leaning politically. They like to talk about mm -hmm. left um, politics, um, democratic policies, and so on. Um, and so they seem very socially uh, connected, seem very hu humanist focused, and so on. I'm not saying all, but most. Yeah. And yet, if you were to walk into their studios, into their office, they're the most hierarchically organized spaces <laughs> you will ever find. The Pope would be embarrassed to see <laughs> how far behind they were in terms of building up a hierarchy. So, um, you know, they, 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 um, they, they, you know, you get walls between owners and others, and the different kind of silos of people, and everybody has, you know, it's actually highly corporate and most left-leaning societies of architecture so we've kind of obliterated that as much as we possibly can in our studio you've got to walk the talk you can't just <laughs> preach it I, I agree with that and that, that actually that sentiment is something i've been saying for a while as well um and even with uh, architecture offices that have a physical open plan uh the invisible hierarchy is very much a, a real thing and they you know you might have a partner sitting in the open space but the way things are run, the way the thinking happens, the way meetings are run, it's still very, very much um, hyper-controlled from the top down. Um, yeah, and, and that's true. And, you know, I don't want to suggest that there isn't value in that because you ultimately do need a structure and mm -hmm. some people do need to make hard choices. But the way in which it's curated and, and connected to others is important. And we're not flat. We do have a, a, a structural system in our studio, but our intention is to allow for um, 
um, movement across the platforms rather than straight up and down. So I like to say when, we, when you're thinking, it's important to think vertically, but act horizontally. Think, ver- <laughs> think vertically, act horizontally. <laughs> right, right. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. And I think we definitely want to kind of dive deeper into how the office works and all of those things. But uh, briefly talking about the issue of of uh, of, of segregation and security and these words I think are, are very close to each other in a lot of ways in architecture and uh, clearly security is used as you said often as the the to foil um, exactly yeah. exactly to 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 allow for certain other things to happen um, but so I guess one question is that the I like also how you tie the the ideas of segregation or mixing people and ideas uh, across different scales. So it applies in different programs. So it applies to an office, it applies to a small office, a big office, to government institutions, it applies to a lot of things. But do you think that the general public, the people we have to convince, especially those in power, are understanding or open to understanding like the, the power of of space planning and architecture as you're talking about? It's never an easy task, but ultimately, if it works and you can pr- convince them that the innovation that it brings with it empowers them to do their work better, and if it's a, a commercially oriented group, mm-hmm. that it might even give them greater profits, then they'll listen. And you, we can see that happening across uh, already commercial platforms in the world where great companies, uh, companies who have been more or less embedded in the uh, industrialization of the world are now recognizing that they need to change their their uh, mandates. They need to change their program of how they work. So we're seeing that now with a number of projects we have. Uh, we're working with the Ford Motor Company, hmm. who is one of the great motor car companies of the world. And they have been uh, slowly transitioning from the siloed way of working to a more interactive, interconnected way of working. And they know, uh, as many companies have found, that as you move in that direction with the complex society that we exist in, they will make their company a better place. It attracts younger talent. It invites innovation. And it allows for a natural and more organic growth of the company rather than a stilted stepping kind of pattern uh, that they had uh, existed within in the past. Many companies have seen this. Mm -hmm. Now the next step is, can government see this? Some governments have tried. I'm here in New York City, and one of the former mayors, um, Mayor Bloomberg, attempted to do that in the uh, mayor's office, removed a lot of the walls, opened up a more uh, interactive platform for people to work together, uh, associated satellite teams with one another. And uh, that was really interesting. I thought it was pretty successful. The people that worked in that administration felt good about where they worked. Um, So, uh, you know, I think slowly it will happen, but it does take small steps and Mm -hmm. one success at a time. And eventually, things will change. That's true even with uh, notions of climate change. Uh, You know, we, when we started several projects decades ago, where we told our clients, you've got to think about um, uh, material use, you've got to think about off gassing, you've got to think about energy use, and so on. And they would say, well, we don't have the money, you silly, you know, (laughs) hippies, Uh, just, you know, put on your dark glasses and give us something sexy. And, uh, you know, that it was like that practically, until suddenly there began little cracks in the system. And those cracks got bigger and bigger until governments, state governments, primarily, Mm -hmm. uh, began to initiate uh, legislative action that demanded that new projects would have to meet certain certain energy use criteria. And there was one project we were on where when we started the project, those state mandates didn't exist. And in the middle, suddenly they were voted in. And we went all the way from being a pariah to being told, you must meet these energy criteria or you're fired. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> so, you know, it, it takes only a few things to make change and it never happens quickly. That's interesting because... Um, uh, the incremental idea of it and knowing that it's going to take time, I think is perhaps important too, because especially when you, I think we are living in very polarizing times and everyone's on one side or the other on pretty much every issue, it feels like, um, yeah. that if, if you're going to have a, a, more, a discussion that, that is, uh, that is trying to produce innovation and, and 
conversation, you need to find terminology that's not going to spook people uh, from the yeah. from the beginning, a knee jerk reaction in a sense. Yeah, and we do that through two platforms. One of them is developing ideas around financial sustainability because hmm. all things in the economy that we live in have to be stabilized from an economic viewpoint. Um, you know, you you can't, and this tends to be the underlying challenge of a of a capitalist democracy or any any other society that uses some form of capitalism, whether it's socialist or even communist. Uh, the the economics platforms build off of one another and they can get out of balance. So um, in other words, you build financial sustainability for one group at the expense of another. Right. Is that sustainable? No. It's sustainable in a small frame, but not in the larger frame. So trying to get things more in line with one another, knowing that some people take more risk than others, therefore their profit will likely be greater, um, but not at the expense of those that support that profit. And so we try to show um, in various ways within a, a project how um, these kinds of ideas that we're putting forward help build a stronger economic platform, both within the project life and after the building is built, mm -hmm. what kind of return they'll get out of it. I, you know, I, I hate to say it, but that's just one of the things we have to think about, return on investment and those sorts of things. And if you can talk about that in a natural way, people will be brought along. Otherwise, they're going to feel threatened or who knows what. I mean, there's a lot of greed involved, I, I have to say. it's I'm just as greedy as anybody else, so it's not like I'm innocent. But, um, you know, the greed notion or instinct takes over and so you have to bring that into control mm -hmm. check the ego uh, check the vision and values that's true with a number of issues that we put forward also outside of um, climate abuse which is what i call it instead of climate change right. we are abusing the climate climate change is a natural thing so outside of climate abuse issues which is unnatural the world we live in mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of other issues regarding um, social and cultural institutions that need to be balanced and protected. And we see that often in the public realm. So it used to be uh, when you told someone in a commercial or even an in institutional project that you needed to deal with landscape, you need to deal with the streets, you need to deal with the things outside the building. They thought, we're not paying for that. We're right. paying for this beautiful sculptural thing that screams ah and wow <laughs> moments every 10 seconds. And that's all we care about. Um, and over time, people have begun to realize that as interesting as that might be, uh, the society around that beautiful object falls apart. And when that society falls apart, their beautiful ob object looks like crap. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, no matter how beautiful it may have been uh, built as. So um, people are now willing to invest in streets, invest in sidewalks, mm -hmm. invest in parks, plazas, social spaces uh, to make their property worth more. And so uh, finding the, those languages is important. That's interesting. So I, I was actually going to ask, have you seen, you know, throughout your career, a change generally, obviously, with the clients that you work with, a change in perception uh, and maybe a focus of it being just on, on you know, solely on the financial return and solely on the uh, the aha moment from the sculptural to something that's a bit more holistic? That 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 has shifted a bit? Yes, I believe so. The society in general in the world has become more and more pressurized. Um, that's, by the way, not a, necessarily a bad thing. The, the challenges that we are living through are often the result of newfound liberties that people who never had the opportunity to speak their voice sure. or discuss their liberties have now found. And so um, it builds up complications in society, protests in the street and so on. If those people weren't given that opportunity, in other words, if they remained enslaved in any kind of system, then we would not be going through these pressures and still those in, in authority would be living quite happily. Um, so the, the pressurized world we live in is, is, a, is a symptom of positive change, um, although it's quite difficult. But those pressures have made those that were protected in the past realize that they need to reevaluate their goals sure. if they wish to remain successful. Right. And of course, whether we like it or not, self-preservation yeah. is a big part of life. And so um, that has to be built into these because I think people that are demanding their rights are 
are saying that they uh, they they need and, and and must have those as a part of society. But I don't think ultimately they want to, you know, radically harm other people. They they just want to get it in balance. Mm -hmm. Some harm happens during that world, but. Um, I believe that essentially everybody wants everybody to be fairly treated. And uh, right now it's kind of like this. So there's a kind of attacking. Yeah. But I think if everything were closer, you would have less of that kind of violence. But that's a, a long, hard road that we've been going through now for six, seven thousand years, <laughs> a little bit more. Right. Um, by the way, I am reading a book for those of you that are interested in. I'm reading two things right now about politics and an architecture. Um, one of them is not by an architect or, or, or anyone who's professing to be an architect, but certainly has very strong architectural language uh, and its connection to politics. It's a very weird book. It was recommended to me by a somewhat obscure artist uh, in Italy who I love. I mean, he's very well known in his world, but other people should get to get to know him better. But anyway, the book, uh, the book is called Bolo Bolo, B-O-L-O, B-O-L-O. And the author is very abstract. The name P.M. That's it. That's <laughs> all it says. Very hard to find. I think it was published in the 1980s. Oh, wow. But it talks about the planetary work structure that we have created and that we all exist within. Um, and and so. Uh, trying to understand that in a better way helps us understand what motivates us. That's one really good book. And the other one I'm rereading, which is also from the 80s. Sometimes it's great to go back. <laughs> and and, and uh, it's a straightforward book called Expressionist Architecture by the author Wolfgang Pent, huh. which uh, on the face appears to be just an encyclopedic uh, representation of the development of expressionist architecture from pre-World War I and the Art Nouveau movement to post-World War II and the Bauhaus movement. Um, but the introduction and several of the chapters talk about the development of architecture in Germany between World War I and World War II, hmm. which, um, uh, you know, not so long ago, we would have said, oh, well, that's who, that's so long ago. Nazis, they're out of, you know, no more Nazis right. or, you know, uh, crazy fascists. Why, do we, why are we even talking about that? Yeah, right. And now we're like, well, hmm, maybe those people <laughs> still exist. And, and so the way in which architecture grew in that environment and how it pandered to the different uh, um, hierarchical groups, the fascists, the national socialists, the industrialists who were putting other people, uh, the workers in, in, in a different category than themselves, all of that, how it created actually the architecture that we now base our architectural world on, hmm. the industrial, post-industrial modernist movement. Wow. We'll have to definitely look into those two books. I think some of the things you said, uh, there's a lot to unpack uh, here. <laughs> Sorry about <laughs> no, that. No, no, it's fine. My grandmother used to call me Chatterbox, so just tell me to shut up <laughs> at any point. <laughs> perfect for a podcast. That's what we want. Uh, but I, I think, um, you know, I think the statement that everyone, most people, let's say, I think there's some people that are just assholes, but most people want to live in a state that's uh, less well filled with violence. And I think that's true. When we get to a point that's closer to equality, well, that it'll, things will become less stress stressful in a certain way. Um, but also the acknowledgement that we do live in a capitalist society, that's part of the equation. In fact, that's the underlying base of the equation. Yeah. And you can't disassemble you, it. Exactly. Sadly. You can't. And I, I don't think it's going to change unless the zombie apocalypse happens. Um, so, <laughs> And then it'll just start again. And then, sure. and then it'll just start again. <laughs> so like, but this is an important thing for, I think, designers and the more creative minds to be really aware of, because when you have when you're embarking on projects that are going to have a real impact and they do get built or realized in whatever manner, you have to have a be able to have a conversation with those who are funding the thing and understand where they're coming from. You know, even if you, that's not yeah. your initial motivation, perhaps. Yeah, it's true. And um, we have to respect uh, the table that we sit at. Right. And we learn from them and they learn from us. And unless we sit at the same table and try as hard as we possibly can to speak a common language, uh, we are going to build a division. And that's a challenge, in, certainly in the architectural design profession. Um, after World War II, um, I mean, the, the, my, my uh, sort of industrialist modernist history is based most recently on events after World War II. 
Um, and as we all know, there was a tremendous amount of devastation in the world after World War II. Entire cities were wiped out, some of them annihilated off the face of the earth. And we had to rebuild um, most of the world after that uh, incredible war. And so there was a need very quickly to rebuild. And architects, there weren't enough and they didn't have the skills or capacity to rebuild that quickly. Mm -hmm. So engineers were, were rebuilding our, our, our public uh, spaces. And engineers knew how to do it. They could get it done quick. They were efficient. They were methodical. They were practical. They, they didn't leave things messy. Everything was good. But then they, after a certain period of time passed, everyone looked around at what they were building and were like, yeah, but it's really ugly and I don't sh I'm not sure I want to live here. <laughs> so, you know, the engineers were amazing, but they didn't have that kind of intuitive human nature uh, connections to aesthetic and our, our psyche that, that uh, architects often have. So um, then we sort of switched gears and said, well, this is looking pretty messy. We, now there's more architects. Let's get them in. They'll rebuild for us. So the architects jumped in. They started building everything up uh, in Europe and uh, in a number of other places, uh, the Middle East, where there was also a lot of um, bomb and, and war damage. And in the United States, there was the not so much damage, but you had the baby boomers. So mm -hmm. everyone returning back and needing housing quick. Yep. And uh, so it had the similar quality as needing to rebuild as in Europe without the bombs, but the same problem. And so the architects started to do stuff everywhere. And they got very excited about making the world better, which architects love to think they can do, make the world better. So they um, did as much as they could. But then because they're not so well-versed at construction techniques anymore and not so good at engineering, these really beautiful things they were making started to fall apart. And so everybody's like, well, this looks great, but they're, they're falling apart. You know, the ceiling's leaking, the windows don't work, and you know, all these flat roofs don't work well in the snow and all of that stuff. And so um, the architects got kicked out, and, they were, and then project managers were invented. <laughs> it's uh, like, well, we do the engineers. We don't have the architects. Let's make these project managers, and they'll just deal with both I see. and make the bridge. Um, that worked for a while, too, and the project managers were managing everybody and all of that. But eventually, the project managers, as the world got more complex, weren't, were, became a bottleneck. They became this kind of very narrow window that you had to pass through, and everything had to go through it. And it, it removed the designers from the users of buildings very mm. far away. And so things no longer worked. They just simply didn't function. So the project managers got kicked out. There was a fear to return to the engineers. The architects were changing, so everybody went back to the engineers, but the, uh, the architects. But the architects had, by this time, had created such a strong academic world that they were coming from. Schools of architecture were growing everywhere. Uh, professors were everywhere. We were just teaching of architecture just exploded. And we built this, this academic theoretical world for ourselves hmm. where our language was mutated from the language we used to speak into a kind of jargon that only architects could understand. And we'd sit down at the table and we'd try to talk about what we were thinking about and everybody just got kind of glazed eyes. Like, what are you talking about? Axes and all this stuff. It just it didn't mean anything to anybody or frozen uh, parametrics or whatever. You can build up any number of terms. And, and so for in our, in our office and in my world, I'm trying to – it's not that I don't have jargon and I don't have academic speak. But when I'm at the table with people who have financial needs, stresses in their own financial world, or problems with understanding program, I work at, work, work at building a common language. That's so important. That is an amazing brief history of <laughs> the <laughs> But so I'm curious, so like, um, g give us some like rough dates. So like, you know, you were talking about the schools of kind of blossoming and then crystallizing Well, the engineers language. took over immediately after the war, immediately. So mm -hmm. um, in, in the mid 40s. Um, and that moved also, by the way, that was the time of the baby boom. So after the war, you had total destruction in Europe and uh, the areas around the Mediterranean and Japan. Uh, and and East Asia, uh, 
uh, a, a little less so in in uh, in the subcontinent such as India, but there you had revolution and so on, and, and a civil war and other things. Uh, uh, Soviet Union and Russia had a tremendous amount of rebuilding to do. So immediately after the war, with with all of that context, we had about ten to fifteen years of engineers and o engineers in overdrive. Mm -hmm. You know, not only built rebuilding bridges, what one expects them to do, but uh, actually making housing complexes, building new towns, and so on. Uh, then after uh, that, uh, the architects were brought in. So uh, sort of the, the it, it happened slowly from the sort of late 40s. And by the way, the Bauhaus already existed. Um, and they were, and that's the thing about the Bauhaus. The reason why the Bauhaus kind of blossomed was that it had that engineered industrial psyche right. about it. Right. And the engineers were rebuilding. And so they fit, they fit right into that kind of need at the time. Um, and so throughout that uh, period of the late 40s and then into the 50s and 60s, we have the blossoming of the architects uh, going in probably even into the uh, mid 60s and into the 70s, where architects were taking over building the new towns and building things. And we started to look at, you know, you even see in movies with, I don't know, James Bond and stuff, how architecture, or, or Alfred Hitchcock, sort of, even though some of that's a little earlier, but we had this heroic uh, modernism. Although interesting with Hitchcock, by the way, and to a certain extent, James Bond, you'll see that modernism is equated with evil. Yeah. So um, right. all the really yeah. most beautiful buildings, which we really appreciate as architects, were where like the bad people hung out. <laughs> but uh, anyway, <laughs> there was a there was a kind of move towards architecture. And, and then in the 70s, 80s, a little bit, and certainly in the 90s, the project managers took over. And the project managers really blossomed in the 90s, probably, I would say, and well into the period that we live in now. On the other hand, uh, we did see in that same period, the rise of the starchitect, yep. right? So the, the great architects that people just were on the cover of all the magazines and were on every flight uh, book that you pick up in your, uh, as you're eating your dinner on the airplane, uh, all of that stuff. And that was, the, that was the kind of reaction to the project manager. So it was a pendulum kind of swing. And that, that sort of happened, you know, in the last 20, 25 years. So these aren't like hard and fast dates, but sure. they're like flows of, of, of uh, their evolution of flowing tributaries of thinking. So how do you kind of how do you perceive the current uh, era or state that we're in as for the for architecture in, in the broadest yeah, sense? Yeah, we're we're entering a world where um, uh, one hopes uh, that things like botany, ecology, um, science mm -hmm. of these worlds, uh, under better understanding of nature uh, and um, geology and the sciences of materials and energy become more than just things that architects talk about to make themselves feel good. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty well put, actually. That's pretty, that's pretty well put. Uh, and furthermore, let's hope that they get so embedded in our thinking that we will be able to rejoin the tributaries of architecture that have been created in the last 20 years. Because what has happened was that you get the environmentalists going off in one way and the sexy, iconic sculpturalists going off in the other way. Right. And these people are making the, the ecology-oriented or environmentally-oriented ones are making buildings that are kind of not very inspiring to mm -hmm. look at and kind of boring. And the sexy ones are like crazy and exciting to look at, but they, they're just e horribly difficult in their relationship to the world around them. Mm -hmm. And those two don't need to be separated. They can be brought together. And we try to do that all the time in our office. So we have a number of projects which are incredibly powerful from an environmental perspective and we hope are beautiful and inspiring to look at. They don't need to be two separate worlds. And uh, that, that's great. And it, that certainly ties right into, right into your office of the multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach and these things. Transdisciplinary. Tra oh, trans okay. <laughs> <laughs> Beyond disciplinary. Um, I think uh, I think maybe it's, it's, it's a little bit challenging for architects or scary uh, because you're having to acknowledge that there's this big world of expertise that is vital, essential, and should be part of what you're doing, but it's not it's not your your background or your training. Yeah, and that's a part of the change that I that we feel we were a part of 30 years ago, or at mm -hmm. least maybe we were a little early, but 
we named our company not after people or owners. We named it after a place. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's a place in the landscape. Uh, Snohetta the Mountain is a place. Um, and that did two things. It talked about the value of the world uh, the, uh, that we occupy, that we're stewards of. And it talked about the idea of moving the architect into a different threshold than the point leader based on a personality. Hmm. And so um, we were a bit early in that, but today we're seeing more of that. We're certainly with younger architects, we're seeing more arrangements of studios that feel like societies rather than like um, authors. Yep. And that's a big difference. And, uh, and so um, as we, we begin to um, dip our fingers in the mud, and participate in society, which we have been avoiding and still are to a certain extent. As we participate in the messiness of society, we have to recognize that we are a player in a large team. We, we, there is, there's coaching that's required, but even the coach is part of a team. And so we're, um, in, we are co um, participants in a society. Mm -hmm. The challenge is, and this remains a challenge, and I, I understand it in some levels, is that many people, many critics, for example, don't really want that. They don't want messiness. They want perfection. They want beauty that's beyond perfection. Uh, they want photographs that, without people in them that make things look spectacular right. 10 seconds after they were built. Mm -hmm. They want neatly tied up theories that package everything into a very clearly defined manifesto. Mm -hmm. We're still clinging to uh, the um, sort of previous sense of modernism that dictated the power of the architect. And the critics often are a part of that. Um, we make many projects that I'm not entirely proud of. There are things that I'm not really happy with all the, all the characteristics of it. But we didn't walk away. We played with all of those people who wanted nothing to do with design. We pushed as hard as we possibly could, and we did as much as we could in the worst of possible environments. And to me, those things have as much value as the most perfect uh, uh, sort of tabula rasa mm -hmm. sculptural icon that you can make. Now, I'm not saying that those types of projects are bad because I'm inspired by them too. I'm inspired by those amazing standalone structures where every screw head is perfectly aligned. But uh, you know, at the same time, the world is messy. And if we want to make the world a better place, you have to risk the messiness. I really like this idea of messiness. And I think it's sometimes uh, in a way, <clears throat> you know, different from um, uh, like uh, the discipline of architecture wanting to be a capital D discipline of architecture, and this is very clearly defined what we do, and almost in, in a way is self-preservation. Again, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, but the but but the the messiness is for sure real. It, it exists. It's there, and the work's being kind of through that in a way makes sense too. I have to ask. I have to wonder though, if this kind of tension or difference between the messiness and embracing that in a certain way, or at least acknowledging that, uh, versus having, as you described, like the very clean, um, I don't know, solution, the clean project, the clean photograph. Is that always going to be a tension between those two? Uh, is it that the messiness is just too complicated, too long form of a conversation to have? Oh, I'm, I don't disagree with you. That tension will always be there. But it, the intention is <laughs> the important <laughs> thing, right? So what is our intention? Is our intention and the goal just for that piece of perfection that is lifeless? Or is our intention to participate and strive for perfection and accept that sometimes even the imperfect has value? And that's where I think the problem is. We take away from the value of the imperfect. And um, the complexity, we take, a we take away from the complexity of life. Many people, for example, when I read about how uh, projects are evaluated, it's about, well, actually not even about their final life because normally projects are evaluated shortly after they're built. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I wish we didn't publish anything until at least one year 
after it was built, but we, we can't because of the pressures on, on wanting to get something out. But really a building has a life and it, you, you should get to know its life as much as its birth. Um, but in my, my point here is that uh, at that point where it's released, we talk about it as though it's a thing, that we're a physical object. A building is not just a physical object. Yes, it is, and its physical presence has consequence, but we, A, don't even talk about the consequence because yeah. it hasn't had a long enough life to mm -hmm. understand what the consequences are. And B, it's the product of a consummation. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It's like talking about having a baby and not discussing the actual <laughs> things that you have to do in terms of sex to have the baby. Right. <laughs> or if the baby's going to be an asshole. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you just don't know. No. What's going to happen yeah. once that baby is, lives a life? I mean, we, we, the other challenge that we have as human beings, and this is not just architects, is that we exist within a frame of mind where we feel we need to categorize everything. Mm -hmm. And this was... This was fortified during the Victorian era in uh, in the West, where um, zoology and other kinds of things, science was built upon categor categorization, which helps us better understand a complicated world. Because if we just look at it as one big ocean, it's just really difficult. So categorization helps us see things in groups and in pockets. <laughs> But after a while, if you're not careful, that categorization then builds physical barriers between categories. Yeah. And suddenly categorization turns into segregation. And we are in a stage where segregation has been a part of our lives. And I, I feel your question earlier about where are we going? Hmm. Let's hope that notions of segregation are being broken down. And that's one reason why these issues of social justice are so important. Breaking down segregation and barriers between our societies racially and ethnically and in terms of their uh, characteristics of how they live helps us break down other groups of segregation we have built in to our professional lives, the, the segregation between landscape architecture yeah. and architecture, or between ecologists and botanists and designers, or between scientists and graphic designers. It, you know, th those have to be, you know, it, again, if we're going to talk about supporting policies in government that are about breaking down barriers and bringing unity to one another, then we better be doing it inside <laughs> of our profession at the same time. I, yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I think um, that's also what I like about, uh, I think, your work, but also the conversation today is that there are these key concepts, and they are concepts in, in, in that they're abstract ideas that are equally uh, applicable, applicable and understandable through a bunch of different things. And there's a tendency for a variety of reasons, I think, for all of us, in, including designers and architects, to uh, understand, let's say, the idea of segregation in one way but then just not apply that thinking to other parts of, of society. Yeah. And, uh, and furthermore, many of us that are in, I would say, that having the privilege of doing what we do, because it's an enormous privilege to be an architect or a landscape architect or even an interior architect. It's, we are very fortunate to, to enjoy that world. Um, and as we uh, move through that world, especially if we've had very good educations, or have found ourselves reasonably comfortable in a certain way financially, we start to build false dichotomies mm -hmm. in the world. And there's a great deal of that. And that began in, in, in an extreme way during the uprisings and the civil unrest that we have seen regarding notions of social and racial justice in, around the world and certainly in the United States over the past year. Um, suddenly it was, you know, this kind of extreme false dichotomy that was being built that if you didn't do this or that specifically in this specific way then then you were evil and there was a lot of um there, there's been a lot of um flame throwing going on everywhere uh including myself and our practice without anybody wanting to spend the time to understand uh the worlds that we exist within and and what we do and what we strive for I'm not going to in any way suggest that we are perfect or that I am perfect, and I don't think we've ever claimed to be that way. We simply have directions that we want to travel, uh, mm -hmm. and there's plenty to learn and plenty to grow from. Um, but we have to be careful as we have the privileges that we have that we don't create even more trouble 
by building a false dichotomy between those we feel are against us and those that are with us. And interestingly, um, I get that some of that needs to exist because there really are some extremes out there. Sure. Um, but knowing where those extremes exist and knowing where the intentions overlap is very important in a, in a, in a society where we have to uh, build it together. And that exists within the profession and outside the profession. You know, I think the overlap of intention is probably one of the greatest um, uh, unifying things uh, between, let's say, opposing sides uh, in, in a very, very fundamental way. But, um, and this is maybe less architectural now, but uh, the misinformation, that's probably the biggest problem. Right? Yeah, misinformation is a serious problem. Yeah. Yeah, because even if we have the same intentions, and let's say we, you and I have the same intentions, but politically we're, we're opposites, uh, if yeah. we're getting different information, it's, uh, again, how do you even have a conversation across that yeah. table? Yeah, well, well, I go back to your question earlier and the discussion we had about mm -hmm. architects building their own language. Yep, right. And, you know, it, 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 sometimes the misinformation is deliberate uh, in the world, and sometimes it's just a fact of building the wrong language. <laughs> uh, so it's misinterpretation as much as misinformation, and 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 you can do that deliberately or not deliberately. Um, uh, so yeah, misinformation and the lack of of uh, balance of of you know and 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 we often use the word facts, but even even that word is is a little it makes me a little uncomfortable. There are some things that are more factual than others, but um, we often know that pretending that there is an ultimate truth or an ultimate fact can also be as problematic as anything else. Because as mathematicians and great physicists will tell you, as, start as, as soon as you start to get into the world of ultimate facts, mm -hmm. you are entering the world of religion. Yep. And, and, and so uh, there becomes a faith component of, of science. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to keep our minds open, but we also need to recognize that there is a structure, at least in the basics of our physical world, it may not be all of the things that we're aware of. I mean, for all we know, there's a matrix out there that's running us all. But in our day-to-day -day <laughs> yeah. lives, there are certain physical characteristics that we have to accommodate. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think, um, yeah, for sure, there are some uh, designers and architects that kind of, I think, claim to be pushing the boundaries of their own profession uh, while kind of ignoring some of the fundamental things about the physical environment that exists or how societies and people work. Yeah. Um, and you know, to me, that has to do with a very important word and that is consequence. Hmm. Um, we talk about planning or we talk about a theory about something we're trying to structure and we will dig, dig, dig into that theory <laughs> till there's, you know, all the way through the planet earth and we're still digging. And, uh, and uh, yet we rarely talk about the potential consequences. What does this mean? to those around us. What will it do to those people that interact with this thing that we're making that's so well considered from a theoretical standpoint? And by the way, hmm. the theory doesn't have to be abstract. Some theories are based on on physical things. Um, there are many planners and out there who say you need to have so many steps to the nearest square or block or people can only walk so far and you can only have this kind of sunlight in a, in a plaza and all of those things. Those are theories too. They're just more practical. Even those theories uh, can disengage with consequence. They're based on consequence because mm -hmm. they're based on some degree of observation. But if there's one thing we know about human beings, if we try to build a model to accommodate them, they will break that model as soon as they possibly can. Right. We are really good at breaking any kind of model presented to us that tells us how we're supposed to act. And that's, and that's because uh, intellectual sustainability is a big part of what we are as uh, what we need as humans. We need challenge as much as we need sustainability. We need intuition as much as we need predictability. We need to party just as hard as we need to study. You know, it's it's all of that stuff all wrapped into one. And so there will never be the perfect model, the perfect theory. And the consequences of how a theory we have evolves over time or can react to different interpretations is something we rarely talk about in the profession as a whole. 
Right, right. You know, all this conversation reminds me of a of of a book actually that was gifted to me and I've started to read. Um, I think it's called The Brief History of Humankind. Um, as, oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I know the yeah. <clears throat> it's pretty fast. It's more of an evolutionary standpoint, and you know, and not contemporary. But some of the issues uh, I think we're talking about of, of essentially human behavior tie actually way back to evolutionary reasons, which is kind of kind of frightening. Um, but uh, the other thought that came to mind while you were talking is the use of the word direction as as being distinguished from um, like the final product or the thing. So uh, a, a theory of some kind that dictates exactly what the final outcome is, like it must be six feet wide or it must be, I don't know, whatever, is perhaps yeah. very different from having a common direction. And this is also maybe even parallel to within an office, having a common direction or, or motivation versus saying, I know what style, end product style it's gonna be. Yeah, and in order to accomplish uh, this kind of intention, you have to be open and you have to observe humans mm -hmm. doing things outside of your studio. Uh, you have to um, you have to be aware that you cannot engineer life perfectly. Yeah, you can support life, but you can't uh, engineer it. And oftentimes, uh, for example, here's a conversation I was having the other day where there was some architectural development going on on a project and there was a desire to kind of connect one part of a street to an entry mm -hmm. and a very bold architectural statement was created, very beautiful and very, very sophisticated uh, that connected uh, these two places on the building. Um, but I, I, my comment was... Um, sometimes I think as an architect, we need to think a little bit like painters and a painter often works in the idea of gestalt. So uh, a painter will not draw a line between the Madonna's eyes and the child's eyes, but your eye goes from those two between those two. Mm -hmm. So if the Madonna and the child is there, there are many things in the painting that will help you bring your eye across it. And that's true also in uh, contemporary paintings uh, that are abstract. Uh, you know, there's things in the painting that push your and pull your eye around without actually drawing a line. Mm -hmm. and that's because the mind is incredibly powerful to create imaginary connections between things. We, we love to do that. And you don't have to make that line visible. You just have to think about how the mind works and how it can be moved to think in a particular way, nudged mm -hmm. to think in a particular way. And that happens in physical space quite often. And I know when we uh, develop some of our projects like Times Square, whatever, there are certain things uh, that move you through these spaces without um, uh, building walls for you. Um, targets can be used. This is true inside of buildings. You have a target. You see that target, something that catches your eye way over there. Right. You're naturally going to want to go there. It could be daylight. It could be an elevation. It could be a sculptural work, whatever. You don't need to like put a line on the floor. <laughs> that says, go this <laughs> With <way."> an arrow. <laughs> yeah, which, by yeah. the way, was extremely popular about 25 years ago where all the axes were like, we have to map. It was, it's called mapping. Right, right, right. Like, let's, let's put the, you know, we're just going to map this out and then we're going to show it, uh, you know. Like, really? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just a moment ago, you were talking about kind of like lobbing you know, flames over from one side to another. And you, I think you said that your office had done that too. What were you referring to? Lobbing flames? Well, you, you have to... You, I think you said, uh, well, this was a f maybe a, f I don't know, a few minutes ago now, but you were talking about um, the kind of polarization in a sense and that there's a tendency to kind of throw flames from one side to the other as opposed to having a more meaningful discourse. And oh. I think you mentioned <laughs> that something like that happens within the office as well, or the office had done that. Throwing fire at each other? Yeah. Well, I don't know if it was, I don't know. I was asking if it's in the office or the office threw fire at someone else. <laughs> um, gosh, I, I don't remember just now saying that. Okay. And I'm trying to get my head into that. But I would say um, maybe as an extension of that discussion, sure. um, conversation and debate are important. And we have to recognize that in that world, it's also not going to be utopian. There will be heated conversations. There will be strong disagreements. And there will be times where we all feel good about one another and we all agree or we all want to work together. Um, all of those things are natural and they shouldn't be seen as a threat. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is, of course, that uh, over time, um, we've, we've, we've become more and more sensitive to, to the massive amount of threats that society faces, that it can get very touchy to be 
neg negatively engaged. Um, but I found that I can, you know, that you can uh, build consensus somehow, um, even if you differ. Um, but, you know, and, and, and I have to use, say that very carefully be because I do recognize that I'm in a particular position, sure. you know. It's like a company that I've spent 30 some odd years building and I've got a lot, I'm old, so I got a lot of experience, you know, all of that stuff. So um, I'm a privileged person. Uh, and as obviously we're aware of, I'm, although I'm, I'm white, my, I, I do have a complex cultural heritage, including Mexican American and so on. But, uh, um, uh, you know, I see that as giving me a kind of privilege mm -hmm. that, uh, that sets me into a place that's different. Uh, in terms of building consensus, like I may think there's consensus, but it's actually just me agreeing with myself, <laughs> you know, so, so I, I, you know, you need to be careful of that. But, uh, but I feel we're generally good. We're not perfect, but uh, in our studio, we try to, to work in that direction. I like the idea of, you know, embracing and acknowledging at the very least that there is going to be back and forth dialogue uh, you know, some kind of clashing because I guess it's probably what's necessary to have a deep conversation. I think also on a smaller scale, it, it probably comes down to leadership within the office. So, you know, that being part of, of the work in a sense is more, um, I think probably acceptable and, and, and workable if you have the leadership that's calm and collected and not always inciting fires with, you know, every chance they get. And um, misinformation and all that. Mis yeah, sure, that too. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, when we were talking about the kind of the engineers and the architects and the project managers, and then perhaps now with moving into kind of understanding science and that being incorporated in a certain way, the other component that's kind of was always present, uh, and this ties also, I think, to your term of uh, complexity and messiness, is basically we're talking less about a standalone building and we're talking about cities at least that's my how i view it cities and therefore urban design um and that seems to sure. be the other if you could categorize or urban design or urban planning the mm -hmm. other kind of big component probably to your guys's work but also the conversation yeah we we have started normally this comes across as master planning since sure. um that is the kind of professional field that people are often hired for urban planners are generally um, connected to larger institutions, whereas projects tend to be con connected to what's called master planning. We don't use that term master planning. We try very hard not to because we don't like the idea that there's a master that plans everything. Mm -hmm. So we, we try to call it passion planning, <laughs> uh, which is about building up the, the passions of life and the passions of those that are looking forward to the future. Um, it's a little, uh, some people don't like, they think it sounds very poofy or, you know, I don't know, whatever, but we like to use it. Um, so, uh, um, by the way, I mean poofy, not in the British sense, but in the American puffy sense, I guess. Um, so uh, the, uh, um, the idea that there is a passion that we want to build a future around, that's the most valuable part of so-called urban planning and mm -hmm. um, master planning. Most people forget this. So a lot of these groups um, that do this work are, and this is where it also gets a, a little complicated. These are data-driven worlds. And these days, data is is the is the is the god, right? Like you got to have data, and that's because of the this challenge of misinformation and lack of understanding of factual characteristics. And there's no way that you'll that I will say that data is bad. Data is important and necessary. But if we take data alone, and we do not instill it with passion, uh, in intuition, and risk. Mm -hmm. then we are building robot societies, which will be broken very, very quickly. So um, I'm not suggesting in any way that we plan larger societies totally around faith-based initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, not at all. But I'm also saying that data-driven planning as a standalone idea is nearly the same problem. So um, in between somewhere, it's very similar to this idea of uh, climate abuse and sensitive planning, environmentally sensitive planning doesn't have to be the tributary that's kind of sort of ugly or the one that's super sculptural and sexy. The two can coexist. The same is true in planning 
larger uh, conditions of life, which is what master planning, urban planning is about. It's about societies. So um, the data is the way of checking yourself, sure. but it's not the controlling device. And we are now asked in many, many, by many clients to do what is called master planning, urban planning, but they come to us not because we're experts at data, nor are we known as the most glorified architect on the planet. We are building these two worlds together, and they appreciate that. I think I, that's that's wonderful, and it makes total sense. I think data-driven design of any level uh, really poses a several problems, which you outlined, and um, you know, one of them also. Uh, well, so I think maybe there's just the lack of human poetry to it, the lack of spirit to, to the place. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, when things are data-driven, it tends to be, a lot of times, that those are much more profit-driven. And you have to wonder who's profiting off of well, it. Well, profit is a form of data, right? Yeah. In fact, that's all it is. Right. Profit is pure data. It's numbers. And uh, again, it's the same thing. If you approach profit as a data-driven exercise, it will fail. If you approach profit as a kind of free and easy, let's just let it go and barter everything, it will also fail. Yeah. Once again, you have to build a language where you can build connections between the data and, and human nature. And once you can build that bridge and link, it's usually people, it snaps right away. Hmm. And people will see that they can increase their profit by incorporating human nature into um, the society that they're trying to create. And furthermore, those people that are being accommodated as part of their base assumptions are also benefiting. Right, 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 right. Um, I have to ask, you, you know, I, there, there are a lot of uh, practicing uh, architects who uh, just uh, design buildings in the most kind of you know, traditional way of understanding a building. Um, but you're clearly interested in a lot of bigger questions. And you also not only see architecture as being integral to those questions, but have managed to, to, which is maybe the most remarkable thing to to create an office that actively addresses these things in real life through architecture. But so for you personally, when when did all of this become, uh, let's say, the focus? Uh, was it was it always there, or did or was there ever a moment where you thought, "I'm just going to do you know freestanding standalone buildings that look nice, and I'll be done." <laughs> I'll well, be happy. it's very kind of you to characterize us in that way, but I will admit we also do those same kinds of buildings from time to time. Sure. So, you know, sure. we're not perfect. We also have the kind of things that are really just about making this wonderful thing that we're we're proud of. And, you know, and, and it takes time to evolve into the world that you're talking about completely. Yep. But we're always, our intention is in the direction you describe. And hmm. we're just constantly pushing uh, ourselves to be more, as you describe, uh, and knowing that we're also not always perfect. But uh, um, I would say that um, in my case anyway, and my partners and the totality of how the company was founded uh, over 30 years ago, we came from a time when there was a tremendous amount of civil unrest. Uh, there was a racial injustice uh, and, and, and being um, um, carried forward into not only the, the streets, but also on the three television channels that existed on, right. <laughs> on TV that didn't have a remote control. Um, you know, mainly you were hearing things on the radio, actually. And, uh, and so, um, you know, there, there, uh, there was that world that we grew from, which was about being a part of society actively, physically. Mm. I mean, when I was 10 years old, I was on the West Mall of the United States Capitol marching against injustice in the, in the in the Vietnam War and racial injustice uh, and and cultural injustice as a kid you know and, and I was doing that as part of my life and I still am a part of that world so for me it was a natural thing and also my partners uh, when we started the company we were interested in 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 uh, in, in uh, peace and equality and and uh, some form of justice in some way um, uh, and so that, that's somewhere where we came from. Uh, then we, you know, if you add on top of that, the fact that we won a competition as our first project, the mm -hmm. Alexandria Library in Egypt, this tremendously powerful and important ancient institution of knowledge that was built on innovative connections between people, a place where much 
of the uh, structure of science in the Western world uh, can be traced. That was the world we were working with, and I was only 28 at that time, and my I think my partners were all 30 or just around the age of 30, 31. We were all very young, and uh, and so through that project, basing our lives on an now uh, invisible institution, mm -hmm. this ancient library, that built its life on actually incredibly diverse population of thinkers. When we say the Alexandria Library in Egypt, most people think Pharaonic Egypt, the pyramids and everything. The Alexandria Library was not Pharaonic. It was Hellenistic. Alexander the Great was a, uh, was a Macedonian and Greek general, and the city of Alexandria was in very many ways a Hellenistic city, hmm. and the ancient library was Hellenistic, and the Hellenistic world was incredibly diverse. It dealt with what we would now call the Arab world, but at that time, of course, it was different societies. It dealt with the West and Europe. It dealt with Africa. It dealt with the Middle East groups and societies, the Sumerians and the Egyptians and others. Uh, it dealt with Nubians. It, it dealt with just enormous numbers of people all coming together in this place, and that was our first project. <laughs> so, you know, it, it kind of set the stage for who we are. We were very, very fortunate to have that. And I, I think we're still embedded in that ancient library. That's amazing. That's a, a, a really crazy way to start an <laughs> office with a giant project like that, that is dealing with all of these issues. I mean, you guys must have felt also, I, I know, I'm sure that you were confident in, in your uh, beliefs for sure and the skills, but that must have really validated things for you and made them real. Yes, and um, when people ask me about that time in, in history, I often say that one of our strengths was knowing our ignorance. Right. Um, we knew where we were stupid somehow. <laughs> yeah. We knew what we didn't know, and we, and, and we were also happy and confident with what we did. That's, that's not easy to do, and I think it came because we were different groups of people from different walks of life, Norwegians, Americans, there was an Austrian, there was a, you know, all kinds of people, Czech and so on, uh, um, all coming together. And so we had different cultural baggage. And, you know, when you sit at a table and I say, well, I learned architecture in this school. And this is the way we do it. Everybody does it that way. And the other one says, well, actually, I learned it in over here, and it's not that way at all. <laughs> yeah. And you can't just say, well, you don't count. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to find a way to build bridges between those different cultural understandings. And we're still struggling through that after 30 years. It's still it's not clear. So, um, uh, you know, but we take it on. And, uh, and, and so I think um, – uh, really, uh, I tell often younger people uh, who want to grow that it's very important that you understand where your weaknesses are. Even when I review or teach, which I rarely get the chance to teach, but I often tell younger people, it's okay to make a mistake. It's even okay not to finish. Just so long as you are honest about it and you know why you didn't finish mm -hmm. or where the mistake was and what it means. And that should be part of your presentation. Don't gloss over it. Oh and, yes, I, 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 I'm applauding you. I totally agree with this with this idea uh, I, for sure. <laughs> but you know, we we base everything, unfortunately, going back to the to the world we live in. Mm -hmm. You know, we're so graphically minded now right. as architects that everything is about what you put on the wall or what you present. You know, and and we've lost again the ability to speak about what we do. I I did an experiment once where I was asked mm. to teach a short I usually only do short short things. Um and I had the students do their work and then they you know like you normally do they put their work up in a jury room uh, on all the walls with tables and models. Um but the jury was not in that room. They were sequestered, you know. <laughs> and then when it was time to present, I had a separate room with no, no drawings, no projectors, no nothing. And the jury sat there in the chairs and each student stood up and presented their work verbally to the jury without the benefit of any drawings or models or pictures. And they said their names and the, and the jury got a little pad with the names like sticky notes. And then after all the presentations were over, the jury was asked to go into the room where all the projects were and put the name of the person that they thought matched the description that they heard. So they tried to connect the author with the project. 75% got it wrong. Whoa. 
<laughs> I thought it was going to be the inverse. <laughs> no, uh. they couldn't match the project from the verbal description <clears throat> because because a as architects we're not even taught how to speak or yeah. to to use language in any significant way, and b uh, we use drawings as a hitch. So you point at them and you say this and that and this and that. Yeah. It's it's like a um, a crutch. Mm -hmm. So when the when the professional jury had to match the words they heard with the projects they saw, they could only get about 25% of them correct. It's so weird how that works. It's so strange. I, I, oh, I, I, yeah, I think... It makes uh, sense, though. <laughs> I, I, I certainly ha I have have seen that um, and can understand why that would happen. Um, I think, you know, some of the things you were talking about just now also, I think it comes down to, to being very self-aware. You know, the idea that you would... Um, acknowledge kind of that you didn't complete or the flaws that you have or the flaws in the work and just being mm. honest about it uh, requires a, a fair amount of self-awareness and honesty with with oneself and their skill set and their work which is not an easy thing to do I suppose the popular word these days and I'm even embarrassed to say it I used to say it a lot but now it's become very popular empathy mm. um, you know how one builds an empathetic understanding without losing yourself um, you know, you, you, you cannot be so empathetic that you no longer are a person. You're just a sponge. Right. That's no good either. So it's finding, once again, a kind of interesting balance between um, empathy and, and um, self, uh, self um, say, uh, that you have your own dreams and desires that might be your own and right. no one else's. Right, 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 and finding that balance. Um, Zooming kind of back out again, uh, you know. I can previously, do that. here's how we do that. <laughs> oh, there we go. Look, yeah, perfect. <laughs> can we see the outside of What's the building? What's that thing in the background of it? Um, uh, you know, I think earlier we were kind of talking about the the the, the power of architecture and its influence um, <laughs> on yeah. uh, the, some of these larger issues. Um, and you guys are obviously have your feet dipped into these different pools of, let's say, landscape architecture, master planning, urban design, and inter like all these things. Um, was real estate ever something that was considered as being brought into the fold? Oh yes, as but we're just we. As I said earlier, we're really good at knowing where we're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So um, if we were to do that, we would have to build up that professional skill uh, from the bottom up uh, completely. Um, there were certain things that we had either an interest in or that we already had professionals developing. Landscape architecture and architecture have always been together in our company. And many of us, myself included, studied to, at least to a certain extent landscape architecture as an architect. And many of the landscape architects studied architecture. So um, they, uh, you know, there's a crossover already there. Interiors, we refer to as interior architecture. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if that's legal or not in this country in the United States, but it is certainly the word that should be used because interior design implies some kind of, I don't know, some side thing, whereas it's actually architecture. They deal with yeah. really complex issues. Uh, on, on just as many levels as an architect or landscape architect. So um, that's been part of our studio. It's been hard, I would say, to develop that scope in our, in our office because the demands are quite different for interior architecture. They're more touchy-feely. They want to, you know, what does that, what does that door handle feel like? No, I don't like that. <laughs> Yeah, and in COVID times, it's hard to kind of do that. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this you know again goes back to the segregation of different professions. That it's something um, more uh, on the smaller scale of things. Is it's very, very much present the difference between uh, that's the, that's the extreme like decorators, interior interior designers, and then architects. And at least on the residential scale, it's like we're always pulling our hair out. It's like why are you guys making these distinctions? It's insane to yeah. us. I mean, obviously, in every profession, there are distinctions. I mean, yeah. the landscape architects do think very differently than the architects. We're related for sure, mm -hmm. but we're not the same. And so there's a boundary, but, you know, how how strong, of a, how, how thick of a boundary is it? Is it a porous boundary or impenetrable? 
Um, so that's true with interior architecture and architecture too. Of course, there's different things. And I find that, again, I'm an architect really. I mean, even though I like all these other things, I'm basically an architect. But when I look at what the landscape architects do or when I look at what the interior architects do in the studio, I'm just blown away like, wow. You know, you, I could not do that as well because my training is different. Sure. And I say that that's true also with uh, art and architecture. The, they are related, more distantly related than, um, than say, interior architecture and architecture. But, um, you know, when I see how an artist thinks about their work, I know that it's different. Yeah. Even though we both share in some level um, a desire to uh, a, a sort of goal that goes towards making something that people physically respond to, and it's something that is um, affects society in some kind of way. I think we all are working in that world, or we're all wishing that we'll be loved. Like that's uh, the yeah, other right. one. Like just won't everyone just love us, please? <laughs> <laughs> that's probably built into our genetic material. I think that, yeah, that desire. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the office sounds like a really fun place to work for those reasons. But I think also one of the amazing things about uh, working with or being exposed to these different uh, professions and their different kind of realm of expertise is that it, it does make, uh, let's say, an architect in this case specifically, it does make yourself as an architect wonder, you know, am I predetermining solutions based on the the expertise that I have? In other words, I have this idea or vision or direction for a project, and I am uh, biased to try uh, to try and solve this issue with the skills that I have. And meanwhile, hey, there's this guy to the left to be used an artist. He's kind of doing the same thing or achieving the same result, but he's thinking way in a different way and dealing yeah. with different materials. No, oh, it's a great, great point. And um, uh, this is one of the hardest things that architects uh, do. We work with as many artists as we can. And I think since we began, we've worked with over 200 artists. And by working with, I do mean literally working with, like sitting at the table integrating art it's not about saying oh here's a painting on the wall or there's a sculpture over there sometime most of the time it's uh artists working with an architecture project but we also are architects supporting an artist's work mm -hmm. and we do quite a bit of that and uh and you know it's just extremely helpful to expand the mind uh and and you know an artist sees their work uh, this is my little definition uh, I believe to a certain extent, and most artists understand their work as a living organism, actually literally alive. It's not a thing that's over there that I did. It's some sort of living creature. Hmm. And, and uh, you know, that's why if you say to an artist, well, that's great, but could you change, you know, that over there? They're like, what do you want me to add an extra eye to my baby? <laughs> you know, I can't you know, add, you know, I just had the kid and then you're already asking me to put an eye on it. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think hmm. they see that their, their things as an organic living thing that really is an extension of who they are. Not an abstract extension, but a real biological extension. Uh, and so it, it has a different kind of real presence in their life. Right. And, and architects can't really afford to do that because we have to work in teams. Yeah. And our works subject large populations of people to our thoughts. Yeah. And um, we have this kind of other, more direct impact on society. Artists have equally strong impact but it's slightly indirect sure. ours is it's there and you know it's kind of hard to avoid you, whereas you you know the the paintings and the sculptures and the performance art that exists that moves society is working its way through the cracks yep but ours is like a giant boulder that's just thrown in the middle of everything <laughs> And it either blows everything out of the water or it makes a nicer place to be or some version of in between. But um, in that sense, uh, art exposes our, our, our weaknesses as architects because we are so abstract, which is our benefit, right? Because we're abstract. We can change. We can quickly respond. We can do this. We can, you know, we can move through things like, you know, that's what we are good at. Uh, uh, but um, we also know that it, things are more real as we work with artists. Uh, and so in that sense, I would say, um, I'm working with a project right now from uh, several, in fact, and we're working with artists and architects together, literally in a soup. 
and I can always feel the architects wanting to come in and create a theory. Mm. It's just, it's there. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. And th this group, the one group that I'm working with, they've already done something without an architect and it was incredibly successful as a work of architecture, uh, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, I, you know, I'm trying to get my head around how do we break free of these bonds of building abstract theories uh, and, 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 uh, and connect ourselves to intuition in a way which is out of our control, less predictable. It, when you say theory, are you, is this tying uh, maybe directly to the idea of an architectural concept for a project? Yeah, and uh, concepts are interesting. It's perhaps one of the few quotes I've ever had that kind of made it around the world before there were Instagram and viral stuff. Um, I, I think I was actually, I can't remember, I might have been quoting somebody else. Who knows? Anyway, it's part of my head. I said, I've, I've never, uh, I've never uh, heard anyone walk into a building, drop to their knees <laughs> and say, what a fucking great concept. <laughs> I, 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 I forgot about that. I remember, I remember that quote. That's really that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, a concept is there. It's super important. Uh, everyone uh, builds a concept, even in terms of how they live their life. But it is not the result. The concept is kind of the fuel or the, right. the thing that it's, it's as if you were saying, um, I want to be a race car driver. And it's good. I'm going to race the standard uh, internal combustion Formula One car, and the person shows up with the best fuel in the world mm. and no car. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know. It, it, so for me, the way you know, and there's another funny story. I've asked students when I sometimes teach to write down two or three sentences max on a sheet of paper what they think the definition of a concept is. Yeah, yeah. And you'll get maybe 10 or 15 really huge tributaries of differences of understanding of what a concept is. One will say it's this, another will say it's that. You know, there's all these different variations. And sometimes they don't match at all. Other times they're kind of similar to one another. But I'm impressed by the idea that they don't match because every project starts more or less with everyone wanting to know what the concept is. <laughs> And we don't even agree on the definition of the word. Yeah, the, the term concept in, within architecture especially is, is way, uh, uh, maybe perhaps overused, but definitely misused. And you were mm. right, there's, even between teachers in the same school or people in the same <laughs> office, you ask yeah. and you get different answers because it's, it's, mm. it's not really, it perplexes me actually because it's, it's so fundamental apparently, and yet we yeah. don't talk about it directly. And yeah, I, or even if yeah, or even even the idea of saying let's do a project without a concept, boy, you'd probably be killed. Right. On the other hand, you here's another thing you could offer, which I've wondered why we don't do in teaching, and that is give the students the concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Stop sweating it out for nine out of ten weeks coming up with something that nobody even agrees on what the definition of it is. <laughs> yeah. And you say, here's the concept. Now let's make a building. And, and see where we get from there. And, and you know, I wouldn't want to do that for every class, but it would be an interesting experiment. So then let me ask you, so like a, within uh, Snow Hutt's uh, work, is it, 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 you don't like make it necessary for every project to have a clear concept? Like you seem to... Well, we do. I mean, we're, you know, I, I, you're very kind. Uh, I have to say, <laughs> what? <What's laughs> thank, <that> you. <laughs> thank you for saying nice things about us. Um, we, we try as much as we can to be in that world that you're talking about, but I'll be honest. I mean, we have just as many foibles and we make the same mistakes as everybody else. And we do the same things and we're by no means innocent of, of, of things. I wish we could do as many things as we would like. We struggle but we don't give up the struggle at least. And so, yes, there are some projects where we're talking about where, how powerful the concept is as a, as a motivator and others where we say, does it have to really be that kind of a concept with a big C and we take it down to several notches. So um, the, good, the good example I like to give is uh, to define what a concept is. Um, I can only tell through narrative uh, to avoid the standard definitions and terminologies and taxonomy of words and so on. Um, so uh, I would say that at some point in, in human history, uh, we sat more or less on the ground 
uh, eating and doing plenty of things. We, we didn't have furniture. Uh, we might sit on a rock or something like that, but we, we, everything was found. Yeah. Uh, even, even dwellings were not built or designed. Uh, we would occupy space or we would combine something semi-nomadic with something permanent to make space. But in that world, uh, we didn't sit down to eat dinner uh, in the same way we do today. We might have shared a food, but uh, you know it was in a different way. And for the most part, um, if it was even to be cooked as a meal, I'm talking now millennia ago, um, the cooking even was kind of a mm -hmm. disparate a exercise. And there might have been a hierarchical structure how you ate, but probably you would have eaten around the campfire, either sitting on a rock or sitting on the on, squatting on the ground, yeah. which people still do. They eat while squatting. Um, and so at some point, somebody dropped their food maybe on the floor. <laughs> and I was like, damn it. <laughs> and, and instead of just like getting pissed off, they were like, what the hell can we do about this? Hmm. And, uh, and somebody decided, hey, wait a minute. Um, I can put my food on something or I can eat over something. And it and probably originally was something very primitive, like a rock or something. Um, there was an initial concept there of separating your immediate environment from the functional need of eating and, and the food that's cooked and the need for wanting to preserve that food's either taste or eatability mm -hmm. or sickness related right. to dropping things. And as time went on, uh, people said, you know, this is pretty great, but actually I wish I weren't so low to the ground still. I had something larger platform and I could sort of sit around it in a way, squat around it. It's something higher. And, and that would allow me to work standing and sitting mm -hmm. instead of only squatting. And so somehow the first table was invented. And that was the concept to, to, to create this functional change of how you existed and you created the concept of the table. From there, we are where we are today. Oh, it's gonna be a round table with like, like, like uh, you know, crazy legs that look like dog's feet, or it's gonna have red and purple shapes on it, or it's gonna have, you know, a, an unusual like piece in the middle that allows you to put flowers in it, or it's gonna have, you know, yeah. it's gonna be some sort of crescent shape. And everyone says that's the concept that it's crescent, you know, something. No, the concept yeah. is the table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And it's, um, I think the interesting also th part of what you were talking about at the beginning with the table is that there's this idea of problem solving that's embedded and interlaced in, within what we do, right? Yeah. And, and sometimes they're, they overlap neatly with concept and other times concept is this thing that's much uh, bigger and much more abstract to kind of be the thing that at least find similarity or, or glues together all the different parts of, of one big project if, yeah. if, when it's possible. Yeah, the function is, it's, it's embarrassing to most architects because we don't really like to think, some of us, hmm. that function is a pri primary, uh, is the core. You know, we like to think that our intellectual uh, prowess is the core. <laughs> but uh, um, actually, yeah, it, it's a little embarrassing, but it's true. I mean, you know, uh, the, the, the functional needs build creativity. And some of us don't always recognize that. Uh, I would say, you know, I mean, the, uh, the, the equivalent of the opposite of the story I just gave would be the random sort of thing, which is, oh, there's a hunter going out in, in the wilderness and they decide, you know, I wish I had a table thing. And then they made a table for no reason at all and then carried it around with them for miles and miles, <laughs> waiting until they could use it. Right. right. <laughs> you know, that would be the wrong way of developing a concept, I suppose. Right. Interesting. <laughs> Do you think that to be a good architect, you have to be a good person? Um, well, I, I think there's no such thing as a really good person. And we all have our... <laughs> we, you, we, know, you, you know who says that? Oh, good people say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good and modest people say that, but fine. <laughs> we all have our challenges, whether other one, others know of it, and they're only our secret challenges, or they're challenges that other people have to deal with, or anything like that. Uh, again, I, I, it's false dichotomies. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I'm really, really nervous about false dichotomy. Um, but uh, um, uh, the truth is, though, that if you want to make architecture, you have to understand people. That mm -hmm. is your job, number one. And then understanding that and what supports life, which is the environment, 
because you can't have people without the environment to support them. And that means um, both natural and artificial or feral and human made. Uh, without that context, we can't have people. But our goal is we exist uh, as architects to understand the complexities and nuances of, of human nature. Now, landscape architects also do that. Mm -hmm. um, um, and their materials sometimes are different. Um, and But sometimes, of course, and it's the same with architecture, there are fringe elements of either of those worlds that aren't really about people. Um, in some cases, it's only about, in landscape, building up a conservation attitude for a habitat, really, which shouldn't interact for some period of time with people or, or you know, some kind of conservation need. Um, but for the most part, we're making landscapes to interact with human life. Uh, whether uh, it's planned or not. And then uh, with architecture, uh, it's the same. There, there can be a building uh, which is really a support facility or some kind of infrastructural mm -hmm. facility that isn't about occupying every day, but still people have to exist around it. Um, and in both cases, the challenge is that human nature is, is, is not definable. Uh, so uh, we have to open up our understanding and the only way we can release ourselves from predictability and false model modeling of life is to know people better now i'm i'm mainly talking about myself i mean i read things about people i look at people i try to form my own opinions and i try to change them over time um and that's true for me actually with all things so for example uh, uh, when the George Floyd murder occurred in Minneapolis, uh, you know, there was a tremendous amount of news and, um, and, and I was following the news like everybody else and, you know, feeling the pressure of all of that. Um, but I decided, you know, this is too abstract for me. And so I went and went to Minneapolis and I went to the place where, where he was murdered and I walked the neighborhood alone, talking to people and trying to hear their stories. And, you know, it's kind of frightening. Um, there's no need to be frightening, but it, but it was. And, uh, and, you know, and I spent time walking with some friends in other parts of Minneapolis and so on and going to see all the places where the police precinct was burned and everything. And in all that time, I'm, you know, observing people and how they feel and how they think and how they exist. And so that helps my architecture and my understanding of my process. <laughs> That's incredible. It's so fascinating. And it's a, it's a very, you know, because we mentioned Star Architects near the beginning of the recording, it's a very, it feels on the face, at least, very different from maybe the Star Architect mentality. That's not to say there weren't Star Architects who were as open as you are, but, you know, from public perceptions, it's a, it's a different way to go yeah. through life, maybe. It's one of those things, this term Star Architect, and it's always kind of fascinating. There's been long periods of time where I don't know, people would call us up and ask us to do a project. I'm like, well, how on earth do you even know who we are? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's not something you get used to. I think even the, even the, even the very well, well-known architects beyond who we are, um, are probably at times wondering, you know, is this really where I want to be? Um, some of them, of course, I mean, it's like being an actor. Um, I think at, at a certain level, you become a public figure or something. And, you know, you have to be very, very careful. I know many actors uh, often say they get to a point where they can't be human. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they lose, since their world is about presenting humans to other humans, uh, they can't understand how to make that route through. By the way, I do often refer to architecture in terms of acting methodology, hmm. um, because it is kind of similar. When you're an actor... And you're, you're, you know, I don't know, a person from New Jersey who comes from a, a, you know, a pious background who lived in a very nice life and very moral. And you're told, now I want you to be an Irish mafia person that kills people, <laughs> right? How do you transform yourself or whatever direction it is? You're, you know what I mean? It's from one place to another. Mm -hmm. um, how do you transform yourself from that, who you are, to that which you're trying to act as in a, in, a, in a film or play. And so you have to learn how to be that person. Um, some actors do it through method. 
They, they right. pretend they're that person over and over and over again. Some put on the costume and they, when they put the costume on, they are that person. Some just read stories about those type of people over and over and over again until they get familiar with them. We do the same. We should do the same as architects because we're asked to do things that isn't actually our ordinary way, way of life. Um, you know? Right, right. It makes sense. Is that also perhaps sort of tying to an earlier statement you made about, um, I believe it was about like architects becoming uh, more open to thinking like artists in a sense or being open to that that um, that part of their mind or even the vulnerability that's involved? Yes, I would say so, yes. Hmm. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. And so I guess leaping from that then, I do have to also wonder, how do you maintain those kinds of sensibilities with the kinds of large-scale works that you are known for doing and when you have an office that i don't know how many locations you have now or how big your office is but you know it's perhaps some of these more um human and very uh, specific uh almost even more emotional side to to things is is you can be aware of as for oneself for your individual and if you have a team of five that's easy to kind of understand that it's there but when you become as big as you guys are uh, that's got to be a little more challenging. Yes, I mean, um, uh, I would say the maybe one answer, it may not be a fair answer, is that we try to develop a state of mind mm. as opposed to a, um, a manifesto. Um, we try to hire people that are have qualities that, that feel uh, um, compatible with who we are. Um, you know, uh, we are not just looking at their skill sets alone, like, wow, that person's the best, you know, rhino modeler on the planet <laughs> or some other kind of fantastic thing. If they don't play well with others, they're probably not going to do well in the studio. Yeah. Um, so that, that's an important quality. Uh, the other uh, thing is um, that we try to build up sustainable environments within the studio. Each practice sustains itself. Um, the projects are at least one hopes can sustain themselves within the the, the trajectory that of and the project life that an individual mm. um, project might have. So you know there are those things that are there, um, but but you know again it's it's not perfect. We we lose our way from time to time. We try to um, have discussions about design. We we have people present their work and. We don't do it enough because it's so little time these days. Um, you know, even we've had a few times where people have shown the work they did at university, and that's always been a real joy to see. Um, so, you know, we 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 try things um, a lot. Um, for example, we have our regular meetings nowadays. Now these days, they're every two weeks um, on Zoom, and uh, usually at the end of the meeting, we like to have someone read a poem. Uh, so someone's randomly chosen to read a poem or something like that um, that helps us connect in a way. But, you know, once again, I, I, I will say it's still tough. It's really yeah. tough. And one of the things we struggle with is um, the life of people before they have come to the studio, whether it's an academic life or a professional life, getting them to come to terms with how we work sometimes takes time. So some people might have worked in an office where they're afraid to say anything yeah. or they're afraid of any kind of argument means failure. And, uh, and so um, getting people to not only speak up, but also be comfortable to be in a strong, heated debate is quite difficult. Another thing is um, trying to break this challenge of, uh, of uh, domineering theory uh, that sometimes isn't driven by uh, the necessities of the project and instead mm -hmm. is driven by their previous professors <laughs> who are still yeah. in their ear well, going, oh, you gotta, where's your, you know, what's the... <laughs> <laughs> well, I think this also goes back to the point of, like you were saying, when you were conversing uh, perhaps with this, your teammate, and maybe this was at the very beginning of Snowheta, um, like I have this understanding from my school and he's like, yeah, but well, that's not what I understand from for my institution and that's the yeah. the thing too is like when you get into the professional place especially in an office like yours uh no one cares about whatever happened in the past it's like does yeah. is what you're saying is it comprehensible right and yeah. does it apply and is it is it does it have some kind of other you know list of values beyond yeah, that that's right no i don't know if it really matters <laughs> Yeah, you're right in a way. I mean, it's always there, obviously. You can't ignore it. Yeah. 
but it has to evolve. It has to grow. It has to have a life. I have to say, I really like the idea that you think of of the office, and and this this thinking extends to other things in the work itself as as a society. That's、mm. a really interesting word to use to describe、um, like a body of people in a in a very you know kind of where performance is key. You got to produce stuff. There's deadlines and things, and that there's there's little miniature groups in the side of society that are self sustaining.、Mm. Yeah, it's、uh, it's um. Well, it's a goal. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Once again,、uh, you know, we're we're not perfect. Sometimes I, I, I compare、uh, this challenge. I, I always say that look, you know, don't be uh, don't be、um, tricked into believing everything's perfect here.、Um, it's far from perfect, but at least when it is not perfect, our heart's in the right place, and we're trying <laughs>、yeah. to go, you know, in a, in a, in a good way.、Uh, so.、Um, You know, I'd rather be in that environment of of problem than in the other side of that coin, which is just evil. <laughs> <laughs> is is there something in particular that、um, you know you you're struggling with?、Um, you know, either in the profession、sure. or in your personal life that affects your profession. Yeah, that's a good question, Marina.、Um, There's a lot, <laughs>、uh, yeah, maybe more that we're struggling with than things that we're not.、Um, obviously,、um, we're an, getting to be an older company, even though、mm. I still feel very young, and our outlook is very young. And still, people often think of us as a young company, but we are have been around for three decades or more. And even beyond that, we were myself practicing for quite some time before we formed this company. Uh, so, uh, uh, in in a sense,、um, trying to understand change and how youth will 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 evolve, make allow、uh, will, how youth can contribute to the evolution of the company,、mm. uh, is a big challenge.、Um, you know,、uh, we talked earlier about self preservation and ego, and you know, certainly the older you get, that can actually be a problem.、Uh, so you know, you're like threatened by all the the wave of youth thinking.、Um, so getting away from that is is a challenge、uh, for some of us.、Um, opening up、uh, possibility for change is is a challenge,、uh, and you know, and the problem is that change usually requires investment. Yeah, and and that can be both intellectually and financially. Yeah, and so how do we manage investment while also being a company that's actually pretty large, where a lot of people、um, survive off of the paychecks they receive、uh, here from our from our from their work with, together. So、uh, you know, it, it's it's、uh, it's you know a real challenge to make that work,、uh, and you know. The founders of the company, or we're not going to live forever.、Uh, fortunately, we're not named after、uh, ourselves, so those people can still say, "Oh yeah, I'm I'm the Snohetta person." After we're dead, <laughs> and my last name is Snohetta. Yeah. <laughs> so as soon as you're tired, that's going to change. The person is going to change their name. Yeah,、Mike's、it could be someone else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so、um, you know, I, I think that that helps,、um, but there's that challenge. The notion of The severity of、uh, of social justice issues,、mm. uh, which is which are important challenges to an office, understanding our privilege and knowing how we can、um, uh, work with that privilege and make it as something a positive force as opposed to a negative one, which I think we always have been involved in that, but of course it's more acute those understandings now, and so we, I'm kind of welcoming those. Discussions,、um, as long as they're not mean, <laughs> it's a, some meanness out there. But it,、yeah. as long as they're、yeah. constructive, I think you know we have a have a way forward、uh, to to improve、uh, the studios、uh, in that world.、Um, you know, and that's another thing, by the way. You know, we are an international practice, and cultural and social issues do do vary yeah.、Uh, yeah. in certain ways around the world. I mean, if you talk to a person in Hong Kong. About the things that are happening in Alabama, <laughs> you know, it's they're related, but they're not the same.、Mm -hmm. So they're both, you know, they're both issues of of of、uh, challenge between cultural and economic groups and racial groups,、um, but they are different kind of contexts. And one part of the world is from another, and trying to balance that has been also 
quite a challenge for us. Interesting. Um, you know, so uh, that's been, uh, gosh, I guess we could have used the whole show on that question. <laughs> well, you know, well, we'll you just come back anytime. <laughs> yeah, we'll just have you back and we can have a session about the challenges. <laughs> um, um, so you had mentioned uh, that one of the challenges being, you know, st um, rolling in or, or, or yeah, the evolution yeah. of the office and, and having younger generations um, have a positive impact. <clears throat> Um, from that, are there certain things that you've seen as, as being um, general patterns coming from the younger generation in terms of the, maybe the way they work, the way they think, or um, whatever? Yeah, I mean, there's been an emphasis over the last few decades, or certainly the last decade, to save the world, which is a different mm -hmm. kind of save the world than the Bauhaus or the Corbusier or all the other miners had, who also thought they were saving the world, by the way. I mean, when right. when uh, when Corbusier made these, uh, you know, the, the, these city plans with these towers and X's and all, you know, the grass in between, that was a save the world tactic. Right. Right. Um, so that's not new. Uh, these days, the save the world tactic is let's fix the uh, issues of climate abuse, or um, you know, let's let's deal with uh, energy conservation and and those things. There is nothing fundamentally wrong with wanting to save the world, and certainly the intentions are are very good. And today, they are I feel a little more well rounded in the younger groups than the Corbusiers and the others. Uh, might have had in the past or the Frank Lloyd Wrights or those kind of massive uh, Bauhaus intellectuals. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, I think um, I think that we're 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 at least seeing a, 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 a world where people want to reach out and touch a lot of different things and sometimes put their money where their mouth is. Um, but I, I, I think we still have a long way to go um, to get away from the sloganeering to the practicing of these things. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of sloganeering going on. Uh, a lot of, a lot of people saying, well, I, you know, I want to, I, I want to, you know, fix the, this or that, and then don't really want to put in the legwork mm -hmm. or the time to really research and understand the consequences of various proposals of saving the world, because there's nothing more dystopian than utopia <laughs> right yeah and and uh you know the the whole kind of idea that there's a perfect thing it, it, it's it's always grab you're always grappling you're always exploring you're always making mistakes um and you're always trying to move uh move something which is an energetic process a spiritual process and actually that's a big part of it making all of this spiritual and you asked earlier about how do you do things and whatever Things are spiritual. Even even the Black Black Lives Matter movement, which many people just saw as a, maybe a something you needed to say or you needed to have initials up. For me, it was incredibly spiritual. And so strangely, I kind of pushed away from a little bit of the sloganeering. That was just my personal thing because mm -hmm. to me it was so incredibly spiritual. And I mean, I guess because I'm getting older, even when I went to marches, like it used to be when I was younger, you know, I'd be out there yelling and everything. And even four years ago, I went to the old woman, the million women march in, in D.C. and was yelling my body, my choice with everybody. <laughs> but 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 lately, especially after the George Floyd murder, I, I would get in these marches and I just stand off to the side and just cry the whole fucking, you know five miles of crying. And I couldn't say anything. And, you know, it, it, and, and I think that this. Uh, this spiritual connection that we have with the world around us is is has value. Yeah. It has to be really inside. And just saying that we want to do it or pointing to the people that are doing it badly is not enough. <laughs> That's really, really well said. And um, <clears throat> it's not easy to do that, you know, to do what you're talking about, for sure. Now, I don't mean to say that as an excuse, but I, I would also recognize that it's not easy. And I think the reason why that the slogan sloganeering uh, is is uh, so maybe overused uh, and, and relied on is because it's much easier to do that. It's also much easier to propose a utopia and not actually dig in and acknowledge that this might be highly flawed or that it's going to be, as you said, you know, human life and cities and these things and people. It's an evolution. It's changing. It's mixed. It's dirty. It's all these and messy yeah. and messy. Right. And it's just much easier to, to not to, to not deal with that and to say, well, this is my utopia. This is the slogan. 
and they rehash tag it or whatever it is. Um, and yeah, it'll be that's out another there. thing to get used to is this very unusual world of instantaneous messaging and and uh, you know the challenge of of uh, intelligent democracy mm -hmm. uh, versus um, emotional democracy. You know, and and uh, you know the the kind of democracy where you have to work to understand how it works is right. is going away. Um, with the immediacy of everything. Now, I don't want to sound like an old person. Yeah, back when I was a kid, you know, we had to lick rocks under a box. <laughs> you know, I'm not trying to say that. I, I really, yeah. <laughs> you know, I like the fact that things can be more exciting and dynamic and so much we've been able to do in the last two years, really, uh, because of technology. And even now this, because of technology, it's a gift. And I do not for one second mean to suggest that we shouldn't respect it and enjoy it. But we also uh, have to be aware, as many famous scientists have said, if we let technology take over our humanity, then it's over. This reminds me, the last thing I'll say, because we're running out of time, is that actually reminds me of a series on Netflix called The Social Dilemma, which is is frightening, to be honest. I haven't seen it, yeah. I it it talks it. about the issues of uh, social media and technology and, and the impact it has on people, and it's quite horrific. And actually, what's interesting yeah. about the documentary is that it features a number of you know former CEOs, vice presidents of the biggest tech companies, and they're the ones saying, like, this is not... They we're heading in a really, really bad direction. Yeah, it's not good, but I would go back to what I said earlier. It's a symptom of positive change. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't like to be stupid with metaphors, but I mean, when you give birth, it's pretty painful. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, a I baby imagine. comes out of it. I don't know for a fact. I've only been told that. But, but uh, you know, a baby comes out of it, and there's something greater, and, and, and it's beautiful. So, so um, you know, sometimes we have to go through this madness in order to come out the other end better as humans. Um, so I look at it in two ways. Just so long as we're questioning it, that's, mm -hmm. that has value to me. It's when it goes unquestioned that I get very, very nervous. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, uh, I, I suppose, you know, technology for a while was unquestioned. And now with films like the one that you're talking about and debate surrounding technology in our lives, at least we can see that there's a possibility for it to evolve into something better um, and something that helps us rather than, than overwhelms our lives. Yeah. And that desire to question or forcing yourself sometimes actually to keep questioning is uh, maybe one of the most integral parts of being a designer and not easy to do because I think inherently as humans, we want security. We're always looking for that. And that ties to a lot of other issues in the way we do things. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think experiencing a broad aspect of life helps connect. You said earlier mm -hmm. about looking at people. I mean, I'm, a, I'm unusual in many ways. My father's somewhat sort of Mexican-American in New Mexico. My mother's uh, Russian-Jewish from London. I'm born in Germany. I lived in Norway. I've lived in Egypt, and I'm American. But And I grew up very in a very rough area when I was in the United States. I'm 30. I'm 60. I lived 33 years in Europe, so most of my life in Europe. But when I, I came to my senior year in high school, it was rough. There were fights. You had to go through a magnetometer to get in. I had mm. very little money. I, I, I you know, I, I, when I was younger, I I was like, you know, dealing drugs and so was my brother. And it was, you know, it was, I got thrown in jail multiple times. You know, I had a, had a long and unusual life. And then I was lucky enough to, you know, get a scholarship and get into university and learn things. And I took advantage of that and made myself into a world where I decided, hey, I'm going to just try stuff out. And we ended up the, doing together with some strangers, really, the Alexandria Library competition and won it. And then, you know, kept on going. And here I am now. So, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's you have to really take it on and, and really uh really uh, push yourself and i think that does make good architecture okay let's end it there that's fantastic <laughs> uh, that's fantastic uh so mm. thank you so much for coming on the show this was amazing uh, we could go on for another three hours i'm sure and yeah, sometime in the future we'd be, be happy to have you back on what are you doing next week <laughs> <laughs> blessings and peace to everybody and i hope you stay healthy and we didn't even get to talk about covid boy what a relief <laughs> <laughs> that good that well well said actually too <laughs> thanks for listening to this week's episode if you like what we're doing then support the show by leaving a review in itunes that's the best way to support us you can also drop a comment on uh youtube where we yep. live um sometimes sometimes it shows on youtube sometimes it should there and uh, we're in spotify but spotify doesn't have ratings yet 
I don't, they need to fix well, that. Yet, but, but you know. if you can subscribe on Spotify, subscribe there too. Yep, yep, yep. And social medias? We are on all of the social media platforms, pretty much. Um, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, you know, feel free to send us a direct message or leave comments or share our episode release in your stories with your friend. You know, pass the word around if you like the show. Mm-hmm. We also have a hotline. Uh, you can text or call. It goes directly to voicemail. And we've actually been doing quite a few episodes about questions that we got from listeners or even emails that listeners send us when they need some help, some advice, or even suggestions for guests. Yep. And so, the hotline yep. number. And the hotline number, therefore, is 213-222-6950. 213-222-6950. Right? Yes. Okay. Anything else? How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Okay, good. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone for listening, and we'll talk to you again next week or sooner. Bye. Bye-bye.